طيب اوكي السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم جزاكم الله خيرا for all of you for being here um, الحمد لله we are starting a new شرح Sunday just to give a little bit of a background for everybody شرح Sunday is a program that we put together that should allow us or give us the ability to be able to understand the basics of Islam and this is the fourth book that we are doing together for those of you that are new um, inshallah this will be your first book with us all of the previous books that we have done alhamdulillah majority of them are recorded and they are you know saved for you if you want to go back and refer to them the book that we did before this was called al waraqat which is usul al-fiqh the foundations of fiqh the next one that we're doing we did a class on salah and a class on uh, the sciences of hadith before uh, now we are moving on to fiqh. The plan with all of this is that a year, two years of doing Shar Sunday should give us functionality in our religion. To be able to just understand the basics. If someone were to ask us, you know, how do you know the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu are authentic? You'd be able to say, this is how I know that they are authentic and these are the proofs for it. Here, this is going to be a fiqh class. Generally, after studying the first level, a lot of the questions that people have when it comes to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should no longer be there. In salah, in tahara, in, in uh, zakah, in psalm and in hajj. And once we finish this, the, the, the goal is you should feel confident that I am worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. A lot of the questions that I do get are questions that if someone went through something like this, no one would be asking them. So this is the goal of this, the book that we have chosen. It is a very basic primer in the Shafi'i Madhab. And it being in the Shafi'i Madhab, there's not really going to be a lot of differences at this level between the Madhahib when it comes to Ibadat. As you progress in levels, that's when things are going to become um, a little bit, okay, this is not what I learned, this is not how... You know, it was growing up and things like that. The way that we're going to proceed with this is this is a mukhtasar, a book that has been made very small. No proofs are found inside of this. You will not find a statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or a verse from the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala or a, anything with scholars saying this is how it is. This is basically just bullet points of what you need to understand to be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we'll talk about the book, uh, inshallah, later on. Um, for those that have come in, free books are, uh, free copies are provided there, inshallah. The work of fiqh or the body of fiqh, the way that it came about was you had the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the companions. The companions if they had any question on how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or how to live their lives, they had the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they had the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where sometimes things are being revealed based on the actions that they're doing. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passes away and then you only have the companions and those that are going to follow them. In the time of the companions, everybody knew that these were the scholars of the companions. We are going to go and get information from them. They are the ones that are going to guide us in our religious affairs. After them, their students continued. And during the time of their students, the tabi'een, there wasn't still a need to publish something like this. This is a work that was published in the 5th century after the hijrah of the Prophet Wasallam. So this is the year 400 something. There was no need up really until this point, maybe 100 years, 200 years before, where there was a need for someone to put this kind of work together. But as the Ummah grew, and as the level of scholarship started going down, and this is, we know this is a sign, just how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created time, and has created people. The, the most knowledgeable of people are those that are closest to the time of the Prophet sallallahu As time goes on, that knowledge becomes to go away, away, and very few people are able to access it. 
from them is the Imam of this Madhab that we are going to be going through and we'll talk more about him there. <laughs> the Madhahib, and I know this might be a question that comes up, their biggest difference, all of the Madhahib, was what did the students of the Imam that came up or the Madhahib were built around, how did they understand the way that the Imams look at the Quran and the Sunnah to come to rulings? And this is why there's a difference. For those of you that came to Waraqat, you would understand that you would have multiple ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You would have ayats in the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that if you and I were today to open it and look at it, not only would we come with different rulings, we wouldn't even understand what we are looking at. Right? So, the scholars, Imam al-Shafi'i, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, they, they used to look at a hadith and ayat in a certain way and from there they would get their rulings and their students they kept this idea going until we know the madahib to be what they are today so just keep this in mind um, if there's anything we cover and I don't think even today we're going to be covering anything on um, the actual beginning of fiqh that will be for next week today will just be an introduction to it whenever you see it just understand the madahib this is how they saw these things we just need a basic understanding to be able to comfortably say, I know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know what, for example, the first thing that we're going to cover next week, bidnillah, it is the water. What water purifies and what, water, what type of water does not purify. So just being able to understand this is the type of water that purifies and this is the type of water that does not purify. And what makes it not purify. And all of these things, just understanding you go to any body of water, your question is not going to be when you go to the beach, can I use this water to make wudu? You'll already know if you're able to do it or not. Right, so this is just functionality of this deen is what we want through fiqh. May Allah bless all of you. This is a journey that you have to embark on to fulfill the command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he says, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مسلم, That seeking knowledge, it is wajib, it is fard upon every single Muslim. And the faridah, it's filled by a person knowing enough to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was a book before this, right? And I didn't want to make this beginner. And the title of the book is, is, is what the slave is not going to, be, to worry about on the day of judgment. Right? What the slave does not need to worry about on the day of judgment. And this covers things like, you know, belief. And also it covers like this, but much simplified. Right, and that is for what are you not excused from on the day of judgment? Ibadah, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, salah, if you did not learn it properly, ignorance cannot be used as an excuse on the day of judgment. If psalm, you did not learn it properly, ignorance will not be used, hajj, zakat, and all of these things. There are other things that ignorance can be used for, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the ummah is, my, his ummah is not going to be asked about the things that they did not know in terms of the actions that they would do. There's part of knowledge that is that part, where you don't have to know, for example, every single narrator in the uh, hadith, on, in the book of Sahih Bukhari. But just know, knowing what a hadith is and what, what it has for you when it comes to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on, that is the basics that you would have to know. طيب. So you are fulfilling this command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fulfilling the command, any command that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is filled with rewards. The greatest reward that a person has from seeking knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Are those that know and don't know, are they the same? No, they're not. They're not the same. The one that knows is much better. And how do we know that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, that because of your belief, because of your iman, Allah has elevated you. وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has elevated the people of knowledge from the people of, that are believers. So from the entire world, you are better than the people that, have, that are disbelievers. Because of your iman, you've been elevated. From there, the one that has knowledge is even elevated to a greater level. Abdullah ibn Abbas, when he comments on this verse here, he says the difference between the daraja, the, the, the status of the mu'min and the scholar, it is a hundred levels. And every level from one to the other, the distance of a hundred years. 
And even though this is a statement of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, and he is the Mufassir of the Quran, we would say even the levels in between them are greater than that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, فَضْلُ الْعَالِمِ عَلَى الْعَابِدِ كَفَضْلِ عَلَىٰ أَدْنَاكُمْ He says the virtue of the scholar to the worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have the scholar and the one that worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The difference between them in status, it is like my virtue over the lowest one from amongst you. Not even just the regular companion. The lowest one from amongst the companions. The difference between that person and the Prophet sallallahu the person with knowledge versus the one that worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is really the distance between them. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he also says that the virtue of the alim, it is like the moon and the rest of the stars. The scholar is the moon, while the stars are the regular people, or the believers, or the one here, Abid, the one that worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whenever we look up at the night sky, the one that catches our eyes always is the moon. We don't, the, the other stars don't really catch our eyes unless they are clustered together. But just looking up, that this is how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam compared the scholar to the one that worships Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And this is the path that you have decided to embark on while we are doing this. I know that it is different than what comes to our minds when we think about seeking knowledge. But seeking knowledge comes in many different forms. The beginning is these type of things where we only meet once a week. Then from there you increase on to it and you keep on going until your entire life is dedicated to seeking knowledge. And when you get to that point, a believer is always learning. There will always be a status that, is, that you have over the people that are not scholars or students of knowledge. As the advice goes, <laughs> that a person has to be either always learning or at least he has to keep quiet. So for us to even be able to speak, we need to keep quiet. From the virtues of seeking knowledge, the Prophet وسلم, he says, إن الملائكة لتضع أجنحتهم لطلب العلم رضا That the malaika lower their wings for the seeker of knowledge out of be being pleased with him. Of being pleased with them, they would lower their wings. And then he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that every single thing in the samawat make istighfar for the one that is upon seeking knowledge. So while we are in this gathering and we are coming to this gathering and we are thinking from Sunday to Sunday, I cannot wait for that time to come. The malaika are making istighfar for you. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, حَتَّى الْحِيْتَانُ فِي الْبَحْرِ Even the fishes that are in the deepest level of the seas are going to be making istighfar for you. All of this by being on the path of seeking knowledge. Anas ibn Malik, he reports from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whoever dies while he is on the path of seeking knowledge dies the death of a shaheed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma in the Jami Imam al-Tirmidhi, he says that one scholar is a worse enemy to Iblis than a thousand worshippers. Meaning shaitan has a hard time getting to the people of knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has elevated them to a level that no one is going to be able to, after an nubuwa be able to get to. As Fudayl ibn Iyad, he mentions to us and he says, that after an nubuwa and nubuwa is the greatest station that a person can occupy, being a prophet. No one that is a non-prophet is greater than a prophet ever, no matter who they are. But after that, there is no virtue that is given to a person greater than the seeking of knowledge. And you have all began on that path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through it forgive us for our sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate us through this knowledge and teach us knowledge that is going to benefit us and knowledge that is beneficial for us and the people. Now, seeking knowledge also comes with dangers. It also comes with dangers. Before you came to this class, there are some things from the ibadat, from the way that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if you were, let's say, you did them without knowing, there are some chances of them being excused. But once you have the knowledge and you either turn away from it or you begin worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a matter that was not what you have learned, this becomes very dangerous. 
And this is why when Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu anhuma was passing away and he was on his deathbed, he began to cry. And they said to him, why are you crying? When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the first people from my nation to wage jihad on the water are going to be from the people of Jannah. And you are from amongst those people. Why are you crying when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for you and said, Allahum mahdihi wa hadibihi. That Allah guide him and make him guide others. How can you be sad in this moment of death? And they began going through the virtues of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. And then he says, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, أَوَّلُ مَنْ تُسَعَّرُ بِهِمُ النَّارُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ ثَلَاثَةً That the first people, the first category group of people that are going to be taken to the fire on the Day of Judgment are three types. The first one it is Al-Alim, the scholar. The second one is Al-Munfiq. The second one is the one that is, has a lot of courage. And then he goes on and he says, the, the alim, the scholar is going to be brought to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and he's going to be asked with the blessings that you have been given which is knowledge and this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives to a person what did you do with it? he said I taught the people I shared the knowledge that you have given me for your sake then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no you did not do it for my sake you did it so that the people could say Look at how much knowledge he has, look at how much he knows. And the people have said that. For here there is no reward for you. And he commands the angels to take him to the fire. And then he, the shaheed, the one that died in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be brought forth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask him with the courage that you were given. What did you do with it? He said, I fought in your path until I was destroyed. All seeking your pleasure. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would tell him, no. You did it so that the people could say, look at how courageous you were. And the people have said it. The reward that you did it for, you've already gotten it. The people have said you're courageous. Here you have nothing. And he'll be taken to the fire. Then the one that was blessed with wealth is going to come. And he's going to be asked, with the wealth that you were blessed with, what did you do with it? He said, there was no matter that needed donations except I was there to give. And I did it all for your sake. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You did it so that the people could say, Look at how generous he is. Look at how wealthy he is. And the people have said it. Here you have nothing. And then he's thrown into the fire. So Muawiyah, he says, If this is for the three greatest people, because these are levels that a person, not everyone is going to be able to attain. Not everyone is going to be able to seek knowledge to become a scholar. Not a, not. No one is going to be able to fight and say they died in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not a, a lot of people are going to be able to give to such an extent. He says, all of my wealth, they went in your path. So these are the highest levels. He says, if this is their case, if this is the actions that they did, and they would go to the fire, how about the rest of us? Where well, we are not doing any of these things. He says, this is why I'm crying. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is how he warned the companions of learning knowledge that was not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says, whoever seeks knowledge, whoever seeks knowledge for the sake of impressing the people or attaining some form from the dunya, he's never going to smell the, sm the, 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 the fragrances of Jannah. You know, when commenting on this, one of our teachers says, the fastest way that a person attains Jannah in this time, it is through knowledge. And the fastest way that a person attains Jahannam, it is through knowledge. That based on how we are sitting here today, the intentions that we have made, it is either going to make us from those that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَحَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ That whoever threads on a path to seek knowledge, Allah makes the path of Jannah easy for them. Or we are... As the Prophet ﷺ said, the people that learned it for the benefit of this dunya or the, for the benefit of impressing the people, they will never smell the fragrances of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. So while we are here, the first thing, <laughs> clear your intentions. Your intentions should be all of this, Allah. that here I am just to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the only thing that I am here for. 
Not so that I can take this knowledge and learn from it and say to the people, look at how much I know. I know when Imam al-Shafi'i was born, I know when he died, and so on. None of those things. Just so that through this, I am in worship. Tayyip, that's the first thing. Question? Um, I, I know your, your emphasis is most on, mostly on sincerity, but I'm curious if you would discourage people to study the madhab if they don't plan to implement it. So they just want to learn the madhab because they can learn the madhab. Allahu Akbar. Discourage to study the madhab if you don't plan on acting on it. Tayyip. Uh, so, so, his question is it okay to study the madhab but not intend to act on everything in it? So, our, this is how we should look at this. Everything that we are going to learn that is beneficial, I'm going to act on it. The madhahib were made easy for us to be able to say, okay, this is the way. But again, there's going to be something like some of the things in the Shafi'i madhab that are obviously different than the other madhahib. If you are, and I know our brother's Hanafi here, so if, and I see a few other Hanafi brothers. If that is the madhab that you have chosen, then khalas, this is how I'm going to do my thing. But at least now you have the knowledge of this is how the other madhahib look at it. And, you know, since this point was, was brought up, there's a few things that we should mention about the madhab of Imam Shafi'i. Right? Just to get us to a, a, a understanding of why it was chosen based on the other madhahib. Like, why wasn't the madhab of Imam Ahmed or Imam Malik or even Abu Hanifa chosen? Why was it the madhab of Imam Shafi'i? In terms of knowledge, in terms of attaining knowledge, the one that is going to expose you to the most breadth of knowledge is going to be the Shafi'i Madhab. And this is not my just claim because I'm a Shafi'i, but this is the claim that the scholars have made, even the ones that are against following the Madhab. Right? We have scholars that are completely against, no need for you to follow a Madhab, and this is something that has come up recently. They would say if we were to study a madhab, it would be the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i. Because in the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i, you have really the two qualities of the two madhab that go against one another in their foundations put together. The first person to come and, and let's say just make a madhab was who? Abu Hanifa. The next one that came after him was Imam Malik. They had two different ways. He had Ahlul Ra'i and Ahlul Athar. Imam Shafi'i comes, having spent years with Imam Malik, and then going and spending time with the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, brings the two ways together. So you have both the Ahlul Ra'i aspect of the Hanafi Madhab and the Athari aspect of the Maliki Madhab being merged in a way where today if I were to ask you give me a name of a scholar I guarantee you that name you give me is a scholar of the Shafi'i Madhab you guys want to try it out? Bismillah just say a scholar any Imam that you know from the past what's the first one that comes to your mind? Huh? Imam al Nawawi. you know in the Shafi'i Madhab <laughs> the later text when you read it right you're going to hear things like that the two sheikhs have said or you would hear or that the shuyukh have said or you would hear it's mentioned in Rawda all of this when they say the two sheikhs <laughs> Imam Nawi Imam Ramli when they say the shuyukh you add Imam Subki to it so the first one that came the, the, the biggest sharh or the like one of the end books of the madhab not only the end book <laughs> The book that the Madahib relies heavily upon, it is called Al Minhaj by Imam al Nawawi. Right? So, look at Shafi'i Madhab. Master in the field to the point where we could say it is his opinions that are put over the, like, what, what he says is this is the correct opinion in the Madhab. That is what is taken. You guys want to try another scholar? Ghazali. Ghazali. Shafi'i. Uh, right. uh, huh? <coughs> Uh, Qurtubi Qurt Qurt is our Malik video. Anytime you hear Qurtubi, and this Qurtubi, I'm guessing you are talking about the tafsir of Qurtubi. So the Imam, uh, Andalus Qurtubi, Qurtubi, so that's uh, our Malik brothers. 
Bin Vez, Allahu Akbar, mashallah. You come, I said before, long time ago. Right? You. I know Abu Hanifa, mashallah. I love it. I love it, mashallah. I like that. Not Shafi'i. For sure it's not Shafi'i. But again, at the end of the day, you just look at, like, no madhab has all the truth with them. Right? There are things that the Shafi'i madhab is, can be wrong to someone in. At the end of the day, our thing is not to see which madhab is the strongest, but more so, which madhab is, like, to me, what seems to be the strongest. And we are not no one to say this is the strongest one. I, if I tell you today that the authentic one from the Quran and the Sunnah is this, like an opinion, what knowledge do I have that these people before me did not have for me to say it, right? They looked at it and this is what they came through. For those of you that were in Waraqat, the first thing that we learned was fiqh is based on what? Yeah, salamat. La hawla la qutullah billah. I was a bad teacher if we don't remember after this time. Avan. It's all built on a little bit of suspicion. Or a little bit of not fully, like, I'm not telling you this is 100% true. Maybe 80% true, this is the strongest opinion. But there's still that room of this could be wrong. Right. No, no, you should not. F if again, that's none of us here, right? Let's just make that clear. Today, <laughs> I can I can look at a Hanafi book, and I will read it, and I, at the end of it, I'll be like, this seems to be the strongest one. And then I'll pick up a Maliki book, and I'll read it, and I'll be like, this seems to be the strongest one. Every book I would read will convince me that they're upon the haq, and because they're they're able to do that, not because of hey, we don't like those madahib, you just come and follow ours. But this is how we actually looked at the ahadith and the sunnah, I mean the Quran, and this is what we came to. And now which scholar do you trust for you to take it from? That's really it. All right, so we'll learn this just to get the knowledge increased and then be given some type of functionality when it comes to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. That should be, and that and that was the practice of all of the, all of the things, like all of the madahib and all of the imams. Now your job is to decide: Are you able to make that distinction? Yeah. So not this room, but other rooms. Yes. So we'll go with those ones. Huh? Right, we'll go. We'll, we'll go with those ones. And to be honest, I, I, I'll be honest with you guys. I have went through stages in learning, right? There was a time where only the Shafi'i madhab was correct, everything else is batil. Okay? From there, <laughs> bat like complete falsehood, everything else. From there, the stage went to no madhab is correct, I have to go to the Quran and the Sunnah. Then everyone else is wrong. Somehow, me all the way in the 15th century found the uh, Quran and the Hadith to go with it. Then now, back to Alhamdulillah to the point of Allah has blessed this Ummah with vast knowledge. So much knowledge. And these are people that, the fact that we still talk about Imam al-Shafi'i today, the fact that we talked about <laughs> Imam Abu Hanifa today, and Imam Malik, and Imam Ahmed, and all of these great scholars, one reason only, their sincerity, that to, until today their books are being studied. Until today people are still ascribing themselves to them. That is something I don't think none of us are going to be able to accomplish. Maybe 10 years after we pass away, even our family members are not going to remember us. Forget other people. This is 1,200, 13 years, 1,300 years later, and we're still talking about these people. So they had sincerity and their works were accepted. So why deprive of ourselves from this breadth of knowledge that this ummah has? To where on every matter, there's someone that has an opinion. Again, not just sitting around and saying, what could be this, what could be this, but how do we actually worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The end goal of the madahib, the end goal of knowledge, is how do I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better? And all of these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted it for them, for it to be all the way here. There were so many other madahib that came, but why were they not preserved the way that these were? 
And we'll talk about it a little bit later, inshallah. Is there like, uh, so between Madhab, is there like some acts of worship that's bottled, not acts of worship, something like some actions that would make Salah bottled, for example, in one Madhab, and it, it's fine in other Madhab, or it's just like difference in for and No, no, for sure, there is stuff like that, right? There's stuff that in one madhab would break your salah and another that wouldn't break your salah. From them like wudu and bleeding, right? How much blood breaks the wudu of a person. And both people have their proofs for it. So you, you get to the point of being able to look at these. And they would say, okay, this is the one that is better for me to go with. But again, why go through all that work <laughs> when it's already been codified for you? When you already have scholars that have decided from what we understand, this is, this is how we see it. Here are the proofs for it. And the others are like, no, here are the proofs for it. So the madhab that you have chosen will bring you on this. So for example, I, I've been in a, uh, in a masjid where blood does break your wudu. And you know when you have like uh, uh, the little scabs and you pick at it? And I started bleeding. And the people were like, your salah is not valid. Are they right in saying the salah is not valid? This is how th they understand the proofs that blood breaks wudu. So for th to them, if my wudu is not there, salah is not there. And so on. So there's stuff like that. We'll, all of it will go through, inshallah. Uh, so for the shatana, that does the blood wudu? We'll get to it when we get to nawaqid al-wudu, inshallah. Okay? Khalas. So, did we explain this in Walaqat? We did. We did, right? What did we say? We said, um, so, as long as you not break, like, there are some cases where you can, and there are some cases where you can. And you gave the example of uh, marriage, and mm -hmm. for example, you cannot pick up. And I think, um, Salat al Jummah, where you can choose marriage you between. Can, uh, with marriage, you can't what? Sorry, can't. You cannot, like, uh, like marriage between the <laughs> So, to make it clear, right, um, if we are going from an, one opinion in a madhab to another one, to actually make life easier, meaning there's like a difficulty that is being removed, this is okay. But if we are going through them simply because of my desires, because I want to do this and I want to do this and this, this is not what we want to do. And when we go from one madhab to the other, it has to be done in a way where... We are not combining them to where this action, both of the madahib are going to reject. For example, he brought up marriage. We won't, without saying names, we'll say there's a madhab that there's an opinion you do not need a guardian to get married. There's no wali to get married. <laughs> there's also another madhab, there's also another madhab that says you do not need to have witnesses to get married. If you go to the madhab that says you do not need a guardian but you also say i'm not going to bring the witnesses this is zina right because this marriage is not allowed you go to the other madhab that says you don't need the witnesses and you say i don't have a guardian this is also zina when you combine a madhab in this like what what will make me follow my desire the easiest in that time you cannot do it but let's say for example like we all do we go to Umrah, we go to Hajj, and we have to leave the opinion of the Shafi'i Madhab that touching a woman breaks you. Both the wudus, right? The man and the woman, their wudu is broken. We can't take that in Hajj because one of the conditions of making tawaf is you have to be in wudu. And we know how Hajj and tawaf is, and Umrah is. So every time I have to stop make wudu, to stop make wudu. So you leave this, there's, a, there's an actual burden that is being removed, right? There's an actual burden. In those cases, you can go from one madhab to the other madhab. Huh? I have a question because you're the, the example that you brought up about like marriage and mm -hmm. witnesses and the guardian, and I don't have a guardian. So, in the case of one madhab requiring something that you do not have, mm -hmm. is in that case, would it be okay to go with another madhab that does not require that thing? So, the guardian is always required. The guardian, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. In that type of situation in which a madhab says you need this thing or you need access to a mm -hmm. yeah. and you don't. Then you would go with the one that you have access Does to. That count yeah. as like so that doesn't count as. No, it, it, so just like on the marriage, right, just, just to make this clear, 
even the ones that, that, that say there's no, no guardian, the, the, the held opinion in the madhab is that you need a guardian. Right? And if you don't have a guardian, you don't have a father, then there's the levels that it keeps going to, right? To the point where it will get, the imam takes the guardianship. And a lot of, well, I don't know about the way you guys get married, but in our culture, <laughs> our culture, guardianship, even while the father is there, is always given to somebody else. Out of respect for that, for, for you know, how, how we do the marriage. So for example, when I was getting married to my wife, even though her guardians were there, there was an elder that this was given to. You take the guardian, you give our daughter away. Even for me, even though I could have just said, I accept. There was someone that was taking my acceptance to say, I accept. Right? So these, like, for the guardians, there will always be somebody. But let's say, like, in another issue where this madhab tells you the things have to be done in this particular manner, but there's an opinion in another madhab, and we'll get to that as soon as we begin water. As soon as we begin water, there's one that is special to the Shafi'i madhab, that is not uh, in the other madhab. And if you can't have access to, in the other madhabs to this type of water, then we'll say, okay, the Shafi'i madhab allows this water to be used and so on, like that. Tayyip? Um, okay, Bismillah. Sorry, one last question. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. do, they, do they also break it down a little bit more on, on their side, or do they follow it to a team? Uh, so so the, the, there's, a, there's a group of people. Right? This is, you break them into different groups. There are those that are able to tell you, even though this is the opinion of the madhab, that this might not be like the strongest one, for, depending on where you are coming from. Right? And you have to have a certain level of understanding between the madhahib to be able to do that. Then there are some that, again, if you were to ask me this in the beginning of knowledge, <laughs> only Shafi'i madhahib is correct, right? So that's straight to a T. Nothing outside of it is right. So you'll have people like that. You have people that are able to tell you the other madhahib have these. And generally, like, as you grow in knowledge, you'll be able to be like, okay. This is how it is, this is how it is. Because the end level of books in the madhahib, their discussion is on this madhab says this, this madhab says that, that madhab says this, this is what our madhab says. So anybody that gets to that knowledge of being able to go through those books and study those books will be able to say, these are what the madhahib say and so on. But there are some again that just follow it to the straight team. Maybe in our lands you'll find more of them than here. You don't really find a lot of people that even follow the madhahib which is what has placed us in the dangers we see today of knowledge in this country. Tayyip, Abdullah. So, you know how concerned that I have those things that are allowed, things that you're allowed to do and not allowed to do? Um, in the case of marriage, are you allowed to marry someone of a different method? Allahu Akbar. And then are they allowed to do the things that... Astaghfirullah al -Adim. Okay, Tayyip, I'll answer the first part of the question. The first part of the question was, can you marry a person of a different madhab? That's what it was. Yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. Even though our people have sometimes taken this to such an extreme to where you would say you cannot marry a person because they are of a different madhab. You are in America. Nobody knows the madhab. <laughs> what? <laughs> what do we know about the Shafi'i madhab? <laughs> what do we know about the Hanafi madhab? What you saw your parents doing? Come on. You know? And then, uh, inshallah, in the other aspect, pick a madhab and stick to it. Pick a madhab and stick to it, inshallah. That's it. You are Egyptians, therefore you are a Shafi'i. <laughs> stick to it. It's weird, it says that about every culture. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's how it works, right? Like, the, the cultures were, the, the madhahib were, like, solidified in, in, in certain geographies more than others, right? But طيب, uh, let's actually move on now. Okay? No more questions. Um, what we are going to do is briefly go through the introduction as quickly as we can. So when we come back next week, we are going to go straight into our work. Actually, before we do that, what's the first page? 
What does it say? Yeah, it, the, the, subki, right? Tabaqat al Shafi'i al Kubra is a book on the scholars of the Shafi'i Madhab. So anyone that had an interest in have like they were they they they, they move the Madhab forward, their biographies would be there. Anyone that you know in, in the Tabaqat, and this is where you would go, and this is a work that's not available in English. This is a work that you would go to to understand which scholars were Shafi'i and which scholars were not. Alright? Um, so this is where we like so in there he mentions who? Bismillah. Ahmed ibn al This is the author of the book, Abu Shuja'. His name is Ahmed ibn al Hassan ibn Ahmed al Asfahani. He is from Asfahan, which is today in Iran. He, Al Qadi, this is a title in the Shafi'i Madhab that if any book you open and it says the Qadi says it, it is talking about Abu Shuja'. No one was given the title like. People had the title of Al-Qadi. But if it's just left alone as Al-Qadi, in any Shafi'i book, it is talking about Abu Shuja'. His name is also Abu Tayyib, his kunya. And they also give him the laqab of Shamsuddin and others from it. So, keep going, Bismillah. Al-Mawardi, another great Imam of the Shafi'iyya, wrote a, a book titled Al-Iqna' Ahmed Abu Shuja' Al-Asfahani um, also wrote a, an explanation of that and then Sahib Ghaya Fi al This is the book that we are studying We'll go through the different names that it has and so on um, the, the name that you see on the cover is what? What's on the, what's on the cover? Matan Abi Shuja' The one that the, your book that I gave you, what does it say, Muhammad? What's the name? Mukhtasar Abi Shuja'. And then the what? Matnul Ghaya wa Taqrib. These are all names of this book. And they all come from the introduction that we are going to go through. Um, instead of reading all of it, we're just going to go and, 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 and talk about uh, Abu Shuja'. He was a Shafi'i, a Qadi. He taught in Basra for 40 years, then becomes a Qadi in the lands of. Khurasan in Persia and um, the most interesting thing about him is that they say he lived 166 years 166 years right if you look at the dates that are put here there's a date of 433 when he was born after the hijrah the death of his is put at 493 they asked him how did you get to this old age in this manner of yours and he says I protected my body from haram so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved it for me to this long age, 166, 160 years. And this is what all of the historians have mentioned about his age, right? Qadi, he did not, because he was a Qadi, which is a judge, he would be busy with teaching and giving out rulings. Because of this, he did not leave back a lot of works. He did not write a lot of things. Here we're told that there are two things that he authored. This matan that we are going to be going through and the sharh of al iqnaa this is in the 5th century. Until today, if you go to, if you want to study, and you want to study the Shafi'i Madhab, the first book in fiqh that you are going to go through, Mukhtasar of Abi Shuja' or the Matan of Abi Shuja' To the point where you have so many explanations that have continued to be written about it. Even until our times, they are people that are explaining this work in writing. But from the ones that stand out, the ones that stand out in terms of the shuruhat, they explain the book and then a bunch of scholars later come on and put like footnotes on there, they make the hashiyas of it. From the most famous one of this, you know, Ghayat al ikhtisar you have one that was written in the year 889 after the Hijrah uh, called Sharh Mukhtasar Abi Shuja' by Sheikh Ahmed al Khassasi. Then you have that really. The, the peak of it will say it is al iqnaa by al khatib Shirbini. One of the great Imams of the Shafi'i Madhab came and he explained this book. And there was a bunch of shuruhat or hashiyat that was made after. Then you have Fathul Qareeb, Al Mujib, Fi Sharhi, Al Fadh, Al Taqreeb by Muhammad ibn Qasim, uh, died in the year 918. And this one is also a very, very famous one. Um, these are some of the ones that you could find today printed and you would be able to go and find it and look through it and so on. Tayyip, flip to page 4, page 3. Ah. 
Oh, uh, right, right behind you. From the Basmala, Bismillah. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, this is the beginning of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The Shafi'i Madhab makes it also a part of Surah Al-Fatiha. And this was the way of the people of Mecca, the people of Kufa, their scholars, and also Imam al-Shafi'i, and also Ibn al-Mubarak, where Fatiha would be read with the beginning of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As for the Maliki Madhab, and others from them, the people of Medina, the people of Basra, the people of Asham, and their scholars, they did not view it as being from Al-Fatiha. As for the Hanafi Madhab, and this is the only time we'll actually break it down in this way, as the, there's, there's nothing that we can bring from Imam Abu Hanifa himself, but from his student Muhammad al-Shaybani, when he was asked, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani, when he was asked about it, he says, Kullu ma huwa kitabullah. Whatever is in between the covers, it is from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim would be part of the Qur'an. The only one that the scholars unanimously agree that it is actually from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is what you find in Surah Al-Nahl. Innahu min Sulaymana wa innahu. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is... The only one that they all agree this is from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, the Shafi'i Madhab sees Surah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as in Fatiha and also in every single Surah. And this is why if you prayed at the MCA in Ramadan in Taraweeh, the Basmalah would be said out loud. What does Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim mean? Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim are easier to explain and since this is the fourth class and we've explained it in every single one, we'll make it short. Ar-Rahman it is wider mercy they both come from the same word of, of rahmah ar-rahman means the one that is the most merciful and this mercy encompasses everything as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us that allah has 100 parts of mercy one of them sent to the dunya and it covers everything the other 99 is saved for the day of judgment ar-rahim it is a mercy that is reserved for the believers in this dunya and also in the akhirah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَكَانَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفًا رَحِيمًا That for the believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was ar rauf and he was also ar rahim From here and other verses, they take it to mean ar rahim it is a mercy that Allah specifically has for the believers in this life and in the hereafter. Now, Bismillah, the intention of it is that this book, this action, whatever I am doing, I am beginning it with asking Allah for barakah. So this ba I'm asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. There is a narration that says that the Quran combines all of the messages of the previous books that were sent down. The entire Quran is summarized in Surah Al-Fatiha. All of the message that you find in the Quran, you could find it in Surah Al-Fatiha. And all of Surah Al-Fatiha, you could find it in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And all of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, you find it in the ba at the beginning. All of it is built upon this word, of this ba, this harf jar that is here. Everything that I am doing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for barakah in it. And there's also a hadith that we would mention where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, كُلُّ مْرِئِنْ ذِي بَالٍ لَا يُبْدَأُ فِيهِ بِبِسْمِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ أَقْطَعَ That every matter of importance that does not begin with the basmalah, it is cut off. Cut off from the barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fahuwa abtar in another narration. Fahuwa ajdam in another narration. It is not going to reach its goal. There's a uh, issues when it comes to the authenticity of this hadith. But following in how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would send his letters. Whenever he would send it to the kings, it would begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The treaty of Hudaybiyyah, when it was being signed, it was written with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And all of these things would always begin with the basmala. And it's also what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the Quran with, yes. Uh, I've heard that the only time Prophet like, uh, with the full basmala, like Quran, like mm -hmm. but even for letters, I think I've heard that it was in the basmala. Um, so f for the letters for Hudaybiyyah, like this is, um, we know that their, their complaint of the Quraysh they had with Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Right, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, they said, we know who Allah is. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, we don't know. And this is why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, whether you refer to him as Allah, 
or with Ur Rahman, or you call him Ar Rahman, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at the end of it, the only thing that was left was Bismillah. But in his writings, like the, the letters that were sent to the different kings, it would have the complete Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. On top of this, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, a more authentic hadith concerning it, is we have the hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells us how we should begin our eating. How the certain du'as need to be said. For example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says, Sammi Allaha wa kul bi yameenik. Say the name of Allah, mention the name of Allah, and be eat with your, with your right hand. For here we would say Bismillah. In places, like the shortest one is just saying Bismillah. And then in our writings, in our readings, in our, there are some actions, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we would begin with the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All of it is I am asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessings, for barakah, and this to be done for his sake. Tayyip, next line. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin al-Nabi wa alihi al-Qadirin wa sahabati ajma'in. Just up to there, wa sahabati ajma'in. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. This is a form of praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply because he is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to praise Allah because he is Allah. Because he deserves to be praised. And it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. That a person praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, this is the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though some scholars in the Shafi'i Madhab have said that the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Hayy Al-Qayyum. The majority of the people are, you never refer to, say, what it, Al-Rahman is a name of Al-Hayy Al-Qayyum. Right? We, we don't say it like this. That Al-Ghafoor is Al-Hayy Al-Qayyum. We say that Allah is Al-Ghafoor. That Allah is Rabbul Alameen. That Allah is Ar-Rahman. And Allah is Ar-Rahim. And this is generally how the Quran presents the name Allah. Right? وَكَانَ Allah غَفُورًا Rahima, And so on. Like all of the things are attached to this name. And this is a name that nobody else هَلْ تَعْلَمُ لَهُ Samiya. No one else has been called by this name of Allah. Even those that would claim to be lords, they would never take the name of Allah. The one that went to the the worst parts when it came to the name of claiming godship was Fir'aun and he even did not use Allah what did he say? Anna rabbukum al-a'la. so here you have Allah and then you have Rabbul Alameen Rabb is someone that takes care of something that maintains something you make it go from stages to stages to stages or the one that is in control or has power over certain things. Rabbul Alameen, the one that is in charge of everything else outside of Allah. Everything that is created is apart from the Alameen. There are some that say Al Alameen, linguistically, it means mankind and jinn kind. Right? So they say this is a Muthanna form of, of you know, Alameen. They say this is what it means. That it is just the jinn and mankind is what's being referred to here. But it also means everything else outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says, وَصَلَّ ala Sayyidina Muhammad. He says, then we send salawat upon when salli here. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا That Allah sends salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The malaika also do it. So you as the believers also do it. Salah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means what? Athana, praise. That he praises the Prophet. ﷺ. And then from the Malaika, it means istighfar. That they're asking Allah to forgive the Prophet. ﷺ. And for us, it is a dua. And it is a raising of the Prophet ﷺ in status. The, one of the best forms of dhikr is sending salawat upon the Prophet. ﷺ. The Prophet, ﷺ, he says. If you hear my name mentioned to you, فصلي عليه. Send salawat upon me. He says, those that are going to be closest to me on the day of judgment, أكثرهم صلاة. They are the ones that send the most salawat upon me. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whoever wants to be pleased on the day of judgment, let him increase in sending salawat on me. So this is what it means from these uh, Sayyidina. Sayyid, this is a title that belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is a Sayyid, the Master. 
the one that is in the times of hardships people are going to turn to so Allah subhanahu wa the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says this Sayyid belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but also referring to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Sayyid and not meaning the same things it is something that is acceptable as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says ana sayyidu waladi adam wala fakhr that I am the master of the children of Adam no there's no uh, showing off there's no pride in it and this is what he is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so in the Shafi'i Madhab you can use the word Sayyid to refer to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then he says wa ala alihi an nabi actually an nabi is a prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent a message to him whether having to go and convey it or not without that part of it just wahi has come to you you become a prophet revelation has come to you you become a prophet you become a messenger when the command of having to go and convey this is there and then he says wa alihi his family wa alihi imam al nawawi rahimahullah he says it means all of the muslims but Imam al-Shafi'i, he says it means the believers from Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib. The believers from Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib that believed in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when we say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi, this is who we are referring it to. But majority of the scholars they take, including Imam al-Nawawi, take the opinion that wa alihi, anybody that is from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as we know the Prophets are the fathers of their nations right they are the fathers of their nations so his family here they say it belongs in everybody that is a believer At-Tahirin those that are pure and we get this Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala he says uh, about the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam وَيُطَهِّرُكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا that we purified you so At-Tahirin comes from how Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala referred to the people of the family of the Prophet Yes. Uh, would, uh, the Min, so he would not in the understanding of Imam al-Shafi'i of being like you have to be a descendant from Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib. And these were the Banu ha- Hashim is how far away from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Third. Uh, the, or the fourth grandfather. And Banu Muttalib is the great, the fourth great uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So anybody that comes from uh, these two that were believers, this is what the Al would mention. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for example, says about uh, the Al-Ash'ira from Yemen, he says, I am from them and they are from me. They would, we wouldn't put them into here if we're taking the understanding of Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib. We would take it as being from the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For example, we have the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي Whoever turns away from my sunnah, فَلَيْسَ minni, Then he's not from me. So this would mean anyone that follows the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is from his, from his ummah. And then, وَصَحَابَتِهِ The companions. The companions, the scholars are agreed, they have to fulfill three conditions. What are the three conditions? Huh? They, met. They, were, they, met, they met the Prophet during his lifetime. <laughs> okay, they met the Prophet Sallallahu during his lifetime. They were, they were Muslim. They were Muslims. Ah. And, they and they died upon Islam. The only, I would just tweak the answers just a little bit. They had to have met the Prophet Sallallahu as believers. So they would have to have met him as believers. There are some people that met the Prophet Sallallahu and later on they become Muslims after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu We wouldn't call them companions. So the one that met the Prophet Sallallahu as a believer and then dies as a believer. He is a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Ah, actually here and then. Uh, what if he meets a Prophet and he, then he becomes a Muslim? During his meeting? Yeah. Then he's met the Prophet as a believer. Right? But so, they are, they are, yeah. They are the ones. Yeah, no, he's saying like if he met the Prophet and he became a Muslim, he has now become a companion if he dies upon it. Ha, Umar. So just to confirm that Jashi was a companion? We wouldn't say Najashi was, was Najashi a companion? No, no, no. He's missing, he's missing an action. And that is meeting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And meeting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could even just be seeing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Doesn't have to narrate anything from him. Meeting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like in this type of gathering and someone is there, he's become a companion as long as he dies. So meeting him upon Iman and then dying upon Iman. So the meeting the Prophet Sallallahu 
That's one condition. They met the Prophet ﷺ. When they met him, they were believers. And they had to die on this. There is a companion, ex-companion, that died. Right? And he was the husband of Umm Habiba before the Prophet ﷺ married her. And he died in the lands of Habasha. He became a Nasrani. Tayyib, uh, Ajma'een, all of them, every single one of them. The greatest, na- the greatest part of the Ummah, the greatest people of the Ummah are the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Without a doubt. The Prophet ﷺ tells us, خَيْرُ الْقُرُونِ قَرْنِي That the best generation, my generation. And that generation included the companions. And not only this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised them in so many different places. The greatest praise of them comes in Surah Al-Fatih. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَكُلَّمْ وَعَدَ اللَّهُ حُسْنَا For every single one of them, after comparing those that became believers after Fatih and before Fatih, for all of them, Husna is promised. And what is Husna? Jannah. For all of them, they're being given Jannah. And Allah is pleased with every single one of them. Mm-hmm. Ah. So if Ali is the entire Ummah, mm-hmm. then why do you say Ali was Sahibi instead of Sahibi or Ali? So again, Wa Alihi, this is, the, even though the majority of the scholars take the opinion that this is the entire Ummah. The one we, we would go with because of our Imam would be, this is referring to the family. So you go from the Prophet, his family, then the companions. And then there's usually an addition of what? وَمَنْ تَبِعَهُمْ No, not his wife. وَمَنْ تَبِعَهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ لَا This is encompassing the rest of us. But if we want to feel a little bit, وَآلِهِ the, the family of the Prophet sallallahu And especially from them, the companions. That's how you look at it. If you look at it from this way. From وَآلِهِ and then وَصَحْبِهِ The family of the Prophet sallallahu which is everybody. But especially from everybody, those companions. Like that. Makes it clear? Ha. I think um, in the Quran, like when it mentions Fir'aun, sometimes it mentions Al-Fir'aun. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean like his family. It means like the... Uh, people that were in Waraqat. What did we say about Fir'aun in the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says? You weren't, you weren't there, mashallah. <laughs> Actually, this word where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, um, This Ala Fir'aun here is only referring to one man, Fir'aun himself. Right? And sometimes in the language, this is how it works, where you mention the family intending one person. So here is like Fir'aun himself is going to enter into the highest level of punishment. And that is different from this Al, which is the, the, the family family. Ah. So here we take his family. The Prophet is also from the family, right? Does that mean his Ummah or does that just mean his family? So it depends which opinion we take of what the Al means. We can say the same thing. We left the same place. طيب, any other questions? Uh, we're going to stop here. Next week when we come, we'll quickly go over from Qal al-Qadi and continue from there until we go through a different levels. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow this knowledge to benefit us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us in the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wow.